All righty, y'all. So this is the Blue Dot Consortium presentation on CubeSat structure design. Um, I'm Joseph Sanchez. I'm the uh, team lead or retiring team lead at Harvard Satellite Team, which is part of Harvard SEDS. I'm senior mechanical engineer, amateur photographer, rocket enthusiast, um, all sorts of things. I do way too much engineering. I'm sure the couple of Harvard people in this room have seen me at like all of the things there. Um, but yeah, and I've been writing a thesis for this last year on the design of an easily manufacturable CubeSat structure. Um, so I'm going to take everyone through just like a quick intro to CubeSat structures, um, how you might go about designing one, why you choose designing versus commercial options. Um, and then I have plenty of time for a Q&A at the end of it, if anyone has more specific questions or stuff related to the hackathon they want to ask about. Um, so just a quick overview on like CubeSat structures overall. Um, architecturally, there's two main styles, monocoque, which is the structure is manufactured all out of a single piece of material. So for example, on the left there, Equisat from Brown Space Engineering, they mill it from a solid chunk of aluminum uh, versus modular, which is more typical, I would say, um, where it's a lot of different pieces and you screw or fasten it together in varying ways. Um, and these kind of both have their own pros and cons in that monocoque is typically, or it can be lighter for a given size. Um, because the fasteners really kill you on weight because the steel is just much more dense than the aluminum around it. Um, but it's mo monocoque ones are typically more specialized. You have to really design all of your payloads and boards to fit into them. So they're much less common. Whereas modular is much more adaptable. It's easier to manufacture. Um, and I'd say it's more what the standard has become for CubeSats. Um, yeah, so first things first with the CubeSat structures. Um, for the presentation, I'm kind of assuming everyone has at least some vague background in it. Um, if not, um, feel free to interrupt me if you like just don't understand what I'm talking about at any given point. Um, but what we'll run through first are like, what are some of the requirements and then the technical specifications for a CubeSat structure and how you might go about finding those for your mission or for any prototypes you're working with. The general like overview of where these come from breaks down into three kind of buckets. Um, you have your ones that are related to launch environment. Um, so these are like the physical uh, systems such as like acceleration, the vibrations, shock on the structure. Um, you have your orbital concerns, which are things that will be covered in more detail in the uh, space and thermal environment workshop later this week. But I'll go through those briefly in that those are things like it's in a vacuum. It's getting really cold and really hot as it goes to different sides of the Earth. Um, and then you have more general ones, some of which come from like meeting the CubeSat specifications. So your center of mass, your overall mass, some come from like user experience. So your ease of integration, how big it is, how you manufacture it, and some other more general specifications. Um, so if you're going through your mission design process, where you'd look for these, pretty much in order, I would say, of hierarchy, starting at like your most important is your launch provider's user's guide. So whoever you're launching with, they usually publish a document. Um, SpaceX calls it the Falcon 9 user's guide. So that's the terminology I'm using here. And that will say what everything that is going to be put on their rocket has to adhere to. And those are pretty much the gold standard of they, it is their rocket. So they get to kind of set the final say of if it's going on here, it has to do this. The CubeSat design specification, um, that further lays out what exactly CubeSats are. Um, so that's things like it can a 1U is 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10, how heavy it can be, where your center of mass is. Um, then below that, NASA publishes their GEVS standards, um, which basically specify what you should test a satellite to in all sorts of characteristics. Uh, so this is a huge document, but I'll pull a few of things out of it. And then if you none of those answer your question on like what something should be, you'd look at papers published by other similar CubeSat missions. And I'd also say ask people on the Blue Dot server because one of them has probably already done it and will answer the question a lot faster. Um, so here's like an example set of tech specs I've pulled together. This is the one for like my thesis satellite. Uh, so this is to be launched on a Falcon 9. Um, and it doesn't really matter right now if any of these like make sense. It's just kind of a knowing what are the things you have to test to. So that first bucket is again, the like vibrational forcing, how much you're gonna shake it, et cetera, um, that determine like what does the structure have to survive on its way to orbit. The middle ones are like, A, is it a CubeSat? Does it meet the size and the center of mass and the overall mass requirements? 
Um, and then B, the second set of those are things that I defined for my thesis satellite in terms of like, can it be manufactured in a shop? Is it easy enough to manufacture? Is it cost competitive? And then the final ones are the ones related to being on orbit. So it needs to survive thermal cycling, it can't outgas, and the surfaces need to be anodized. Um, so a quick run through, like what are the state of the market things or sort of what's out there? Commercial solutions, there are dozens of structures available. And if you have a couple thousand dollars per U that you're willing to pop down on a structure, you can go online, you can order one right now. Um, Pumpkin, Endurosat, Isis, GOM Space, pretty much all of the like CubeSat manufacturers um, sell a structure kit. These are good in the sense of they have excellent flight heritage. They have usually, especially the pumpkin and ISIS and ones that have been around for longer have good user experience in terms of everything is laid out intelligently um, and they've been planned well, they've been well mass optimized. Um, the downsides is they are pretty expensive for what is in its like most base form an aluminum box. Um, they are low customization in that like they're on the website, that's what you can buy. You can buy custom ones, um, but those will cost you almost another zero on the price if you are just contracting that out to a machine shop and saying, I want something very specific and specialized. Um, the other one that a lot of university teams end up doing is building it in-house. So for example, Brown Space Engineering's up there, and then that's a 3U design um, from UTSDL in Texas that they're working on right now for Bevo2. Um, Universities are drawn to these because they're cheap. If you're only paying for parts and if you're working in a university shop and you're not paying your undergrads like most people do, uh, you can build a CubeSat structure for something like $100 per U at the very cheapest. Um, that's assuming you're not having to buy machining tools or anything, it's just all there, which is a pretty reasonable assumption for a lot of universities. Um, it's infinite amount of customization. You can put anything in it where you want, et cetera. Um, and it's a really good learning experience for Mechies on the team. Downsides, of course, zero flight heritage. So you might get it up there and then realize, oh wait, something's not deploying, something's not in the right spot. So that's what you really have to avoid, like do your design properly to avoid. It's a big development time sink and university teams are always strapped for like where to put time because you only have so many members and so much time to get these satellites built. And the user experience can vary quite a lot. Uh, for having talked to some of the brown space people when they were machining theirs, that took like six tries to get it right. And so it went from like, oh, this will be done in like 80 hours of work to like 800 hours of work. So things like that can really get to you. Um, so it is something to consider before you say, oh, we'll just design it and it'll go fine and easy. Um, so talking about that design process, what do you do actually to design a CubeSat structure? it really breaks down into their simulations and there's testing. So at some point you start making CAD for your thing. You say, okay, we're gonna put this and this and this in the CubeSat. You usually end up throwing together some super rough CAD model that is a box. And you say, look, everything fits. And now what you have to do is go into the simulation stage. This is design. You're saying like, what do we need to do to be sure this is gonna pass testing? And you're trying to design the structure to be the best it can. This is where you're doing things like finite element method, uh, computational sims, maybe 3D printing prototypes and assembling things and saying, oh, okay, it doesn't fit. How can we adjust it? Um, and this is so that you can then go on to pass your testing stage later on in the process. Testing, as I'm defining it here, is when you take your satellites and you're putting it in like a thermal vacuum chamber, you're putting it on a shake table and you're qualifying it to go on to that launch provider. Testing is typically expensive or hard to secure if you're asking for it for free from like donation from companies. And it's typically you like take it to the testing site and you want it to pass. Um, whereas simulations, you can say, oh, it didn't pass. Okay, let's do it again. So you really want to get all of your problems out in the simulation stage of design here. For the simulations, typically people end up doing a lot of finite element analysis. Um, just breezing through what FEA is. It's a mathematical approximation method to solve partial differential equations um, that are too hard to be solved analytically. Anyone who takes a structures class, you, at some point you do a truss bridge and you're like, okay, as long, if you make all of these assumptions, you can find out where the stress is in all of your members. Uh, but then you make a real complex structure. It rapidly becomes too hard to do that, especially once you move into three dimensions. So finite element is how you can make a computer do that math for you basically. Um, and it's useful for all sorts of simulations, pretty much anything that uses differential equations over a like 
uh, larger space can be um, approximated with this method. Um, these are where you'll hear programs talked about like Abacus, ANSYS, Nastran, Comsol, uh, Fusion 360, and SolidWorks have, um, have some limited FEA analysis built into them now. Um, and there's all sorts of open source projects out there also that you'll see in research publications every now and then. For aerospace and for satellites, Abacus and ANSYS, I would say, are pretty much the gold standard in that those are what commercially are used. Um, and if your university has access to them, I'd recommend learning them for use on like satellite design. Um, it's a really good thing to have on your resume and they're they are really what's used in the industry. Um, if your university doesn't have a license to them, they are wildly expensive along with those other two open the commercial packages program. Uh, so you might wanna look at the other options on the list. Um, for doing like initial design things, uh, working in SolidWorks or in Fusion 360, whichever like CAD package you work with, using the like built-in CAM, uh, built-in FEA stuff is fine for like initial analysis, um, but it's really not as accurate nor as fast when you move into the final stuff. Um, and the really big thing to pay attention to if you're doing FEA um, design or analysis is the meshing. Um, this is something that it's really easy to click like mesh all on the program and have it just kind of eyeball it and decide what it thinks the best mesh is. Um, and that's how you end up with things that don't actually model reality typically. Um, it's, this is where people take graduate courses on how to do proper finite element analysis is a really like tricky thing. Um, but the general breakdown of like what this is goes into is that you have a couple of types of elements, the two most basic of which are hexahedral and tetrahedral, so bricks and pyramids. Um, and those have their own downsides, but generally, if you can do it with bricks, you want to do bricks and then use tets for anything that is too complex to model with the hexes. Um, linear and quadratic, um, basically linear elements compute faster, quadratic elements are more accurate, and that's your trade-off. Um, and your real thing you're looking for with finite element simulations is called convergence. So if you run the simulation and then you refine your mesh, you make the mesh size smaller so there's more elements on it, you're, you will most likely get a different result. And then if you refine it a third time, it should look like the results are growing to a like stable point. If you refine it once and it goes up and you refine it again and it goes down and then it's just like oscillating wildly, um, you're not measuring reality there. It's, that's a, like the easiest sign that your simulation is not working. Um, if they're converging, typically you're doing fine. Um, and this is the sort of thing where it's fine to do quick and dirty ones early on. And then for your final one, when you're like getting more set on a design, you really wanna have someone else check over your stuff or a professor or a grad student um, to kind of verify that everything's working well. Um, so now kind of talking through what are some of the different tests and simulations you would do on a CubeSat structure. Um, like the first and most intuitive one is acceleration loading. If you're on a rocket, you've all seen the videos of astronauts where they get pushed back into their seat, everything gets squished down. Um, this is something that's probably the easiest to simulate, and it's, so it's a really good place to get started if you're working with a design. Um, all the launch providers will publish some chart that looks like this. This is the one for the Falcon 9 um, as of, I think, this year. Um, but they basically say that design all of your structures to survive this. Survive is pretty subjective for your CubeSat. It's typically defined as like doesn't deform enough where anything internal would um, get damaged or squished and doesn't plastically deform or fracture or anything like that. Um, and then test it out to those red boundaries on this chart. Because um, you're, um, yeah, so you only see loads less than this on the satellite, like on the rocket as it's actually flying. So you test to these larger loads so that you have a safety factor like baked into your design from the start. Um, so taking a CubeSat structure that I've worked with before and putting it through this loading or actually slightly more than this loading. Um, these are plots out of Abacus just to kind of depict what you might see with some of these simulations. On the left, you have displacement in millimeters. Um, so you can see it's got displacement in like the 10 to the negative fifth millimeters. So not worrying at all. And then on the right is stress and again, very low. Um, so these are the sorts of things where you then go through and you interpret these things. You can export the data from your program and do, use it in analysis and decide whether that structure meets your requirements. 
and whether you need to go back and refine that structure further or go with it as it is. Um, the next step that usually is accomplished from there is modal analysis. So this is you're analyzing frequencies instead of like a steady state gravitational load. Now you're seeing how does the structure behave when you're shaking it around wildly. Again, rocket on liftoff, you see the videos and they're, it's roaring and everything's shaking and ice is falling off of it. Well, you have to make sure that your structure doesn't break um, because if you hit a resonant frequency in your structure, it's very possible that it will start oscillating wildly and go out of control. Uh, so this is modal analysis again in Abacus. So you can see kind of what a typical output of that is. You can see as we're moving through the different resonant modes, it's moving differently and they're typically come in these sets because um, you get them in each of the, like the three axes. Um, a typical baseline for this, um, this one it's hard to see because for some reason my thumbnail is really blurry, but our first resonant frequency is somewhere around 530 hertz, which is really good. Um, typically you want a minimum resonant frequency of greater than 150 hertz. Um, and that varies launch provider to launch provider. And then you can use that modal analysis to then go into your various vibration tests. Um, I'm going to talk through random vibration because I think that's like the most confusing one. Um, so the other one you typically do is sinusoidal vibration, uh, which is a lot more easy to envision of you're just kind of forcing it with a sine function and then you vary the frequency of that sine function and make you're basically making sure that nowhere in there does it hit a resonant frequency and have so little damping around that that it would start oscillating wildly and deform the structure. Um, but random vibration is an acceleration spectral density, which is again a really weird concept. Um, this is something that electrical engineers actually will have more uh, familiarity with because it's something called a power spectrum density for electronics. Um, but for small satellites, NASA would say this is the typical way that you could have structural failure. Um, so what it roughly boils down to is you have some, there's so many interactions going on with the rocket as it's flying that you can't really identify like one frequency. It's just kind of a combination of all sorts of frequencies over this wide range. Oh, nice. Good, good to know, Michael. Um, but yeah, so it's kind of all over this range. And so you're basically just saying that in this range, we define this spectral density function and you wanna test your satellite to that function. And as long as it passes this curve, um, if you look at then the plots for a launch provider, they should fall under this curve. And so you're good. Um, again, I drew this from the GVS tables from NASA. Um, theirs is slightly higher than what is defined for the Falcon 9, and higher is fine because as long as you defined, you design to the higher one, uh, you'll pass the lower test easily. I use theirs because it's a much simpler curve, so it's easier to uh, do in software. But if we take our example structure and we run it through that forcing function, what you get out as an output from Abacus to kind of visualize this is what's called generalized acceleration, uh, which is basically acceleration relevant to each of those resonant modes. And you can see if we assume no damping, which is what you typically do to start with, uh, we hit acceleration of ridiculous heading to infinity like program error levels at each of our resonant modes, which would mean the structure would basically fly apart and that's it. You can see at some of our low like higher order resonance modes so like less effective ones kind of we see acceleration that's somewhat reasonable but on all of our base ones it spikes wildly um and abacus simulates this as like a lumped um average you so you're simulating it by like in, interpolating between the resonant modes um which is what this even bias spacing and 10 sample points means uh, for the purpose of this that doesn't matter too much um but now if we go through and we apply a damping factor that is NASA, um, again, NASA specified for low mass payloads, they typically have a damping of around 5%, so 0 0.05 or a quality factor of 10. Um, and you can see that damping is sufficient to bring our acceleration down into effectively zero, um, super, super low, uh, which means the structure would survive that vibration environment just fine, which is what you're really looking for. Um, as far as the damping factor goes, ideally, you would want to go and derive this experimentally for your payload. Um, but that gives you a really bad chicken and the egg problem of if you don't have the payload, like if you don't have your structure, it's really, really hard to go and measure your damping factor and approximating it from CAD programs or from different finite element analysis techniques is kind of a fudgy science at best. 
um, because you always have to make some approximations with that and it's never really amazing. Um, so designing with this like st uh, steady state value is really useful for that um, in terms of it lets you get your design. And as long as you're not like on the edge of acceptable or not, you should be pretty fine. Um, this is one from that set, um, a more realistic structure that I've been working with also. Um, you can see our acceleration values are higher because um, it's a lighter structure and so it responds a little bit more to these uh, resonant modes. And you can also see they're a lot more clumped down here because um, this structure has most of its resonant modes right around 500 to 700 hertz in this like zero to 2000 hertz range. Um, and also here I changed the bias and the uh, points between peaks and how many modes there are. Um, and that's just to give you these like more of a curve because um, you can kind of see how it would respond still with high, heightened excitation around it. Um, bias just means that it samples more close to the peaks, um, which makes sense in terms of it'll give you a more accurate, because um, like down on these trailing ends, we don't expect much to happen. Um, sinusoidal vibration, this is the other way of doing it. Uh, for larger structures, this is more relevant. Um, also, because it's easier, like this is an easy one to test um, experimentally or not easy, but more feasible. Um, it does require these pretty expensive like vibe tables or shaker tables here, um, but you can conduct it in finite element analysis just by putting like a sinusoidal forcing function of just saying like shake it at this frequency and then next step increase the frequency. Um, but in real life, you do it with these vibe tables of it's basically a giant shaker motor. And so you can just shake it and then they're measuring acceleration, probably some sort of like force measurements also in terms of basic like squishing up against the sides, etc. Um, this is also something on big satellites. They often do this right at the very end as like an acceptance test of make sure nothing falls off. Quite famously, they did it to James Webb Space Telescope a couple years back and they had like 20 bolts fall out of it. Uh, which was a really bad sign in terms of for accepting that one. So they had to go back and do tons of like rework in regards to that. Shock is another one. This one's usually not tested too much for CubeSats, lar possibly largely because it's expensive and difficult. Also because since you're in those P-Pod deployers, you're kind of spring mounted at either end and you're in a deployer mounted inside of another thing onto the satellite. So there's a lot of structure around you to absorb these shocks. Uh, but when you have stage separation, you have burnout, any other sort of like instantaneous impulse can give you a really high, really spiky forcing function, something like a Dirac Delta or the like. Um, and these for, especially for large satellites can be really destructive. If it hits like solar panels, really large flexible objects often behave poorly with these. Um, it's a little more difficult to do in finite element analysis. Also, you typically have to do it as an explicit instead of implicit simulation, which again is really beyond the scope of this one. Uh, but because it's so instantaneous, you can't assume steady state at all. Um, so it's really a little bit more tricky to simulate. Testing it is, I think you can see Endurosat did their testing here and they basically drop a weight on the table right next to it and shock it. Um, again, for CubeSats, this is a pretty like perfunctory test and very, very few launch providers require this one. Um, I know SpaceX does not, so it's not too important to worry about, but it's something to kind of know that is on the testing list. Um, thermal cycling and outgassing are the other two things that you really like work on with the simulation side of things. Outgassing, not so much for structures because structures have to be aluminum typically. Um, and aluminum's on the NASA's approved list, as you can see down here at the bottom, which is basically they've done extensive testing on it and they can confirm it does not outgas to a worrying level. And as long as you're using materials off of that list, you don't have to test. You can just say like, it's on this supported list, uh, whatever the relevant standard is, and you're fine. Um, for the thermal cycling, that's something you do have to consider. And it's why the structures are mandated to be built out of these certain aluminum alloys, because um, you'll, expand and contract, uh, obviously, as it gets hot and cold in space. Um, and that's quite worrisome because what they're worried about typically is that if you expand more than the deployer you're inside expands, you can get stuck on deployment. Um, so the CubeSat design standard specifies like four aluminum alloys that you can use. And if you go out of those, you're going to have a real hard time finding someone to fly you. Um, so basically use the 
follow the CubeSet design specification. Um, unless like your payload is the unique structure you're doing. Um, I know people have proposed like 3D printed or wood-based CubeSet structures before. Um, but that needs, if you're going to change that, that needs to be like your specific one difficult thing for this satellite because it's going to be much more tricky to get a deployment. Um, the other real thing with vacuum is cold welding is a concern. If you take two metal surfaces in a vacuum and you squish them up against each other, they will often weld to each other and just stick. Um, so you're required to anodize all of your outer surfaces. Um, that's detailed pretty well in the CubeSet design specification. Um, but it's just something with your structures design to really pay attention to. Um, now walking through like that middle column of the table, which is the build concerns. Um, these are things, so starting with is fastener choices. Um, whether you go you know, pretty much however you design it, at some point you're going to need fasteners if you're doing a modular design. Um, so the two ways you can really do that is helicoils, which are these inserts, or you can just like manually tap the aluminum. Um, a lot of structures on the commercial side of things have moved to using these helicoils. Um, they're nice because they're, it's, it requires a lower dimensional accuracy hole. So you can just kind of plunge the hole when you're milling your structure and then come back and add the threads. Um, so you don't have to either A, tap like 20, 25-ish holes manually and get all of them right, or have a mill that has an auto tap feature built in. Um, it's also really nice because it's a harder thread surface. Um, so these are stainless steel wire helicoil inserts. And so then you can screw things in and out and you don't have to worry about it galling up or like ruining your threads after a few uses. Um, and they have really nice vibration resistance properties. Um, so these are something that I would say is kind of becoming more used in CubeSats. They've always been used, but uh, from the papers I've been reading the last few years, they've become much more common even in like university CubeSats. And they are approved for CubeSat use even though they're not aluminum and typically stainless steel is a like band material. Um, separation springs, that's something when you're doing structure design, you really have to pay attention to because you need them. Um, and it's easy to get art way into design and not realize that you don't have them and then have to try and work them in afterwards. Um, they're a very specified item. If you look through the CubeSet design specification, they give you a McMaster car link for which ones you should use. So use those, mount them. You need at least two on each end. And yeah, the other thing is launch providers. Also, if you're doing a 3U CubeSat, you don't typically need them because you're the only thing in the Peapod deployer. So you don't have to like spread other ones out. Um, but yeah, as Michael said, all of this, everything, like the launch provider has final say on everything. They can say, no, we won't fly this and they won't fly it. Or they can say, oh, we don't actually care about that. You can change kind of whatever you want. Um, a big thing too with structure design, PC-104 is the like typical CubeSat board size. So it's 90 by 96 millimeters, um, has these four mounting holes in standardized locations. And it's ideally what everyone uses for CubeSats. And then if everyone follows it exactly, you can just stack the boards on top of each other and it works great. Very, very few CubeSat things follow it exactly. Um, so it rarely works that easily and you usually have to do a bit more design around it. Um, Pi cubed, for instance, it's PC-104. It doesn't have the stacking header. Um, so you have to run cables and you have to then consider cable routing um, in terms of like, how are you going to route all of your cables? Something we've run into, and I know uh, Cal Poly, I think, has also run into with these because um, we were using their derivatives too, is there's nowhere to run cables around this board. It fills up pretty much the entirety of the like volume inside the cube set. And so you really have to like squeeze your cables around the little gaps yeah, we uh, went ahead and did a custom revision. Um, we did other things to it, but we made it very purposefully like cut little little squares out Chunks so that out of, the, yeah, so out of the board so that if you can run cables past. Um, yeah. Yep. Um, and then some other really popular boards like OpenLST is one of the most used radios nowadays, I'd say. Um, it's not PC-104 at all. It's I don't know that it conforms to any standard. It's much smaller. It's like credit card size. Um, but if you're doing something like that, like you can see here on U Hawaii's satellite, they're using one of these smaller boards. So you then have to consider how are you mounting it? How are you keeping this board secure? Because maybe your structure is fine for the vibrational environment, but then now in your final like test, you're going to have to include all of these boards. And how are like, this needs to be securely mounted. You can see they're saying, oh, look, 
we thought this would work and now it's running into this connector and it's just not going to fit. Um, so that's like the where that's what kind of makes a good CubeSat structure versus like an excellent one is like, can you put it all together and it just works? Or is it like you put it together and then you spend a couple of days with a Dremel and duct tape trying to like figure out how to really make it work? Um, manufacturing, it's really important when you're designing one of these two to consider how these parts are going to be manufactured. Um, because it's really easy to do in the iteration stage 3D print them and be like, oh, it works fine. Um, it, that will really screw you in the end. Milling is pretty much the most common, I would say, for university manufactured structures because it's very common that your university will have a three axis mill that can do like a four inch by four inch by four inch workspace is just bigger than one U of a CubeSat. Uh, water jet or laser cutting and stamping slash bending or sheet metal processes are also used. Uh, though those are a bit less common, water jet probably being the most common of those four. Uh, big things to consider for manufacturing is cost versus dimensional accuracy. Where do you need it to be really accurate, aka like your mounting holes, the springs on the outside, your outside dimensions, mainly mounting holes. Uh, versus if you're doing like cutouts to lower weight, do you really care that they're exactly that size or can it be like a half millimeter in either direction? Because that'll save you a lot of cost if you can define things differently there. And also cost versus minimal mass. If you're trying to lightweight your structure, where can you easily remove material without having to do an entirely different machining operation of like a five axis coming in diagonally to like shave half a gram off here and there. Um, and then designing for your post-processing. So your surface roughness requirements that you have to anodize your outer things and that you have to tap holes, all are things that it really helps if in the design stage, you at least consider those. Um, because especially anodizing, if you have a really complex structure and you're trying to like anodize certain parts and not other parts, well, you have to go through and like mask off all of those parts that you don't want anodized. And so if you have a really complex geometry that will take a lot of time. And if you're sending it out to be done a lot of money, Machining, again, this is pretty much how most universities do theirs. You typically design for a three axis machine because more axes equals more money equals harder to get access to uh, if you're trying to do it for free for your program. Um, the main things in terms of like designing for milling is pay attention to your tolerances. High, like tight tolerance is hard to do slash expensive. Um, inside pockets, you can't cut a square corner on the inside of something with a mill, not easily at all. Um, and that you, I guess the last thing is like re-zeroing operation. So how many times do you have to take it out of the mill, flip it to a different orientation, put it back in? Because if you have a four axis or a five axis, it can do that automatically. If you have a three axis, all of those flips have to be like 90 degrees typically, and you have to do them by hand and get it right back into the correct position and re-zero each time. So those add a lot of time and uh, sources of error. In terms of actually like generating the G code, how to mill it, CAM software is going to be your friend here. No one's going to like do this by hand. Um, it's also really good to use CAM for design verification, as I'll show on the next slide. So if you run it through CAM and it works fine right off the bat, that's a good sign that your structure is like something that you could actually manufacture. If the program says like, oh, it can't do it, or you have all sorts of weird things it's doing to achieve it, that's a good hint that you need to look at your design again and kind of refine it. Which CAM package? Ask your shop. It, whatever they use that, that works well with their machines is the correct answer there. Um, SolidWorks and Fusion 360 both have pretty decent CAM programs baked into them now. And if that works well with the machines, go with it. Those are also what I'd recommend for testing, just because they're probably the easiest to use because you don't have to export your file to a separate program and play with it there. In terms of what I mean for like verifying it as you go, this is an end plate for a structure I'm working on. And what's really nice is you can kind of go through and like have it animate how it's going to carve it out of the block of aluminum as you go. Um, and that gives you a really good way to like fact check as you go. Like if you see huge chunks of material it can't touch, or if it's doing really ridiculous movements to get to them, that's a good sign that that design just isn't going to work. Um, the other important thing to remember if you're doing this for verification is to restrict your CAM program to using like milling bits that you actually exist. Because um, some of them will define like ridiculous sizes to make things work. Um, and you really do need to tell it like, no, you can only use sizes that I can order on McMaster car 
um, or preferably ones that are already like in the shop. And as far as like seeing that things don't work, you can see here it leaves a little bit of material. Um, and that's because I have a little more complex geometry there and the program can't figure out a way on its own to do that. So that's a sign I need to like go back and address that part and either generate like a custom tool path to make it work or change the part so that it's more easy to manufacture. Um, and the final thing, this is the like least technical and probably most tricky of the requirements is assembly slash access. Basically, how are you going to actually put the structure together with all of the stuff in it? Uh, these are some people, I think this was Iowa putting together one of theirs and that's a pumpkin chassis. So a well-known commercial structure. Um, things that you can kind of quantify for this is reducing your total number of fasteners will make the assembly process typically faster and less difficult. Um, having appropriate clearance around the boards, having places to put wires, um, places to put wires is like the really big one. That's the one that will like get you if you don't do it at all. Um, an intelligent order of operations. So thinking through like, how are we going to put all of these things in it? And like, does our method of assembling it make sense in terms of if we have really expensive, difficult payloads, we probably don't want to be putting those in each time for testing. So make a sample, like make a mass sample or make something you can practice with. Also in terms of like integration, if something has to stay in a clean room environment, can it be put in like last so that you don't have to keep the entire thing in the clean room? All stuff like that. Um, all of your edges on the structure, broken slash deburred, that basically means after you mill it or manufacture it, however, it's likely gonna have really sharp little edges and you're going to want to take a scraper or take a deburring tool or the like and remove those so that they're smooth. Um, those are just little things that will come back to bite you if you don't do them. And then making sure that all of your fasteners and connectors you use for this can be used more than once um, because it's fairly unheard of in my experience with CubeSat teams to put this thing together once and have everything work right and then you just like put it on the rocket and off you go. It's very often that you put it together halfway something doesn't work and you have to kind of go back to the drawing board and figure out how to fix it. Um, so if all of your connectors are like single use rated only that means you have to then take everything out and like re-tap holes and make everything work again. So you wanna make sure everything's rated for multiple uses um, or have a like engineering model and a flight model and assemble them completely in parallel, but then only touch the flight model once you have everything worked out on your other one. Um, those are kind of like cost versus design approaches to it. Um, and yeah, I figured that was a really good like basic run through on what CubeSat structures are and how to do this. Um, yeah, also that thread locker on fasteners. Um, some of them will waive that if you use helicoils because they are inherently vibration resistant. Um, not all of them. Also thread locker on your final one is a good idea in general. Um, and that's just literally like thread locker, Loctite, super glue basically that you put in there and it makes sure they can't vibrate themselves loose or somehow fall out and then damage whatever thing you're ride sharing with, block it. Loose screws in space really bad, basically. Um, but yeah, so now what I figured is if anyone has questions related to structures, like more specific stuff or whatever, um, I can kind of take those now because um, we do have about 20 minutes left in our hour slot. And I figured that would be the most efficient way to actually like help people out with this. Joseph, I was wondering actually if we could quickly do like two things live <laughs> because I realized through the course of that um, we didn't really mention much the actual deployer um, mm -hmm. yep. and the deployment switches which are the switches are kind of more like a flight computer thing but I looked at Flynn's slide and he didn't talk about them so I figured we talk about them right now awesome um, I if you give yeah. me one second I have slides on another thing about the deployment thing Awesome. Um, so I can pull that up and de uh, depict it. And yeah, I had considered like remove before flight and the other one and the like rail switches as flight computer, but I can talk about that also. Yeah, yeah. So while Joseph is bringing that up, um, the sort of two things I just mentioned there. First, the deployer, right? You're in a box and it's a spring-loaded box uh, generally that shoots mm -hmm. you out right on the screen right here. Yes, that is a P-Pod poly picosat orbital deployer. They totally wanted that acronym to work. Um, but yeah, it's a spring-loaded box. Like you can see in this lower one, it's literally like a spring-loaded plate. And at some point they pop the lid off and it, the springs shove all of the satellites out. 
Um, these are nice because it's a very standard outer structure. Um, so you can, they know what that structure looks like. Everyone knows where the mounting connections and everything is on it. So you can add those to bigger payloads. If you have a little bit of mass and volume budget left over, NASA, their CSLI basically consists of strapping these P pods onto the base of the deployers for larger satellites so that you can then deploy CubeSats without having to fly a completely separate rocket for it. Um, a standard P pod, it's one three U or three one U's or any combination that adds up to three U's. Um, and they make more specialized ones that aren't technically P pods for six U and 12 U satellites. Um, though those are a little bit more custom on each of them typically. Yeah, and I, I will say that um, it's actually very unlikely that you will encounter a P pod unless you are launching on a NASA or Air Force launch. Uh, I think they're the only ones that actually still buy those things. Most of the commercial providers have their own derivatives of the Peapod that are effectively the same, but have some modifications uh, that mm -hmm. you probably will need to be aware of. Yes. Yeah, yeah I um, think Sat yeah. Search Online comp has compiled a really nice uh, list of what all of them are. And you can see who buys which and like who uses which one. Um, but they are all roughly equivalent in that they're all like spring-loaded boxes, but you're right. Um, some of them have like slightly wider volume requirements or you can have antennas like stick out a little bit further or the like, um, but they are generally the same style. Um, I think this one might have, now you can't really see the uh, rail switches, but what Michael was talking about there is similar to those springs on the end of these rails here you have to have these rail switches, which is basically a similar to the spring. It's a little pin that sticks out. And when it's compressed in, it tells the satellite inside that you're still in the deployer. So nothing is allowed to be turned on. So that has to be like a physical interrupt of your power cannot turn on until the switch releases. Yeah, I believe the, the standard is that you need to have uh, two in series, like physical switches mm -hmm. that disconnect the batteries from the rest of the satellite. Yeah. Um, yeah, I believe the standard is two of those like automatic ones and one manual one that you insert in the side typically um, for pre-integration. Yeah, so while you're just moving the satellite around, right, like you're taking your press photos or whatever, you have the remove before flight pin in there, normally with the fancy you know, red tag. And then once it goes into deployer, you pull the pin and now the flick switches are pressed. And there's actually one other caveat to that, uh, which is there's usually a 45 minute timer that has to elapse from when those those um, those pins go those flick switches go go out um, until the satellite can begin normal operations. That's to allow like when there's a mass launch, uh, proper separation so the satellites don't interfere with each other. And yeah. just as a funny anecdote, not really funny if you're the ones involved, but like funny anecdote, um, there have been situations where satellites have been stuck together. Uh, for one reason or another, and it's always a very sad day because usually you lose you lose both of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thanks for bringing those up, Michael. Um, for other people in the room, if y'all have any like questions you'd like to ask or anything you'd like me to go over again or the like, uh, now's the time to ask it. Shoot, Victor, I saw a hand. Yeah. Qu uh, so. Considering that all launch providers have different specs for everything that they do, do you do you do you usually try to get a launch provider first and then design to their specs, or do you just try to go for the minimum spec that satisfies most, if not all, launch providers? Yeah, because like we we just we just had a lecture on how hard it is sometimes to get launch slots. Michael had a really nice lecture on that, so um, was sort of curious on like, in which comes first, the chicken or the egg? So a lot of that boils down to what sort of mission you're running. If you're working on like a NASA proposed mission where you've got big time funding and it's like a long term and you have technical advisors, typically then early on you'll have a launch provider defined and you'll say like in three years we'll be on this Delta IV launch and so you know your specs years in advance. If you're building a cheap CubeSat and you want to stay flexible so you can take advantage of any launch opportunities, what I would do then is compile a list of all your reasonable launch providers and figure out like what's the most stringent set of specs and design to that. Um, gotcha. Typically, for the major commercial rockets, the specs are very similar. Like if you're launching on a Falcon 9 versus PSLV out of India versus Delta series versus Ariane, all of the specs are pretty similar. If you're on a smaller rocket, the acceleration is often a bit higher. Gotcha. Um, but 
they're usually still within pretty similar specs. Yeah, and I'll also chime in um, for Bronco site, like we're actively going through the process to get qualified for a launch right now. And uh, while I can't give you specifics, right? Because oftentimes this is export controlled information. Uh, what we found is that usually uh, when there isn't a different spec for CubeSats, they will just refer back to the CubeSat design specification from Cal Poly Slow, right? Where it'll just say like, refer to CDS, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, or they'll gotcha. refer to the NASA GEV 7000 or yep. GEV 7000. So those two documents are the baseline and usually a launch provider will only note a deviation if it's above those requirements. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Let me read the chat thing. Yeah. In terms of manufacturing the structure with respect to those switches, um, it's similar to the cube, this, like the separation springs. Um, you can find variations of them that are already on market. And yeah, you definitely need to manufacture like with a spot for those to slot into. Um, electrically, again, that's something that's been done for a long time. So you can find lots of examples of like how to integrate those into your systems online. Um, and they're not a terribly complicated process to do so. Um, but if you forget about it and don't put it into like halfway through your design or at the end, then it's really complicated. Um, but if you look at them from the very start, they're pretty small. Like you can get little separation uh, springs, that separation springs and um, like flick switch that are pretty much the similar size. So they're not terribly difficult to add into the structure. Yeah, if you give me one second, uh, that is actually an element that I can refer to the Brontosat design, just to give an example. Um, the foot switches, like uh, what Joseph's talking about, those are the standard, like that's what CDS tells you to do, put them into feet. Um, but some launch providers now uh, do allow you to do like rail switches where you machine out a little slot in the rail and then like the limit switch, the, the lever just sticks out the side. That's so nice. when it goes in and it's flush, right, it gets depressed. But that is a case of ask your launch provider because not everyone is okay with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think I can screen share really briefly. Uh, this is actually a point of contention for the Broncos ad team because these are actually pretty tricky to work with. Um, yeah, let me just share this real quick. Okay. Yeah, so this was a couple weeks ago. You can see in this image that's kind of small on the screen. This is how our foot switch, ignore this, uh, that's one of our magnet torquers. But um, this down here, you, we have like the limit switch. Uh, and then we, the way we designed it is we drilled a little hole right in the bottom of the, um, of the, of the, of the rail. Uh, a screw is sort of poking out the, the end here. This is just a nut that's like on the tip of the screw. So you can imagine the screw goes straight through. And then on this side, right, like uh, on this side, we have a spring, right, that will make the, make the screw normally out, right? It will normally be in an out position and only when it is in the satellite or in the deployer, spring is depressed, limit switch is depressed. And in this case, it's wired so that it, clo it, it opens the switch when it's depressed. Um, if there's a lesson learned here, it is, uh, this is the one, uh, component that you actually want to have like a loose tolerance on um, because our original design kept getting stuck like one in 10 mm. actuations right it would get stuck and you'd have to like bang it <laughs> to unstick it which is obviously not something you do in space so we ended up having to take like um, a dremel to like weren't wear, wear away like uh, some of the material so that the tolerances were looser and then this setup here this comical setup I personally, physically sat here and actuated it 2,000 times just to make sure that it was not going to get stuck. Um, but yeah, that's one way to do it. Uh, thing to note is you are not allowed to lose any material off of your satellite larger than like two centimeters or something, or maybe even two millimeters, I think. I think it's two mil, yeah. Yeah. So like this screw, the reason this nut is here so that it is it, so that when the, the spring goes, the screw doesn't fly away. You cannot dump stuff into space because that can be big problems. Um, yeah. Yes, CubeSat specs are pretty much in metric, pretty much. As with anything engineered in the US, I would say, like 
there's a few, but like the specification is 100 millimeters by 100 millimeters by 100 millimeters is a U and everything's kind of defined from there. Um, you'll see, you'll find certain vendors that put their stuff in not metric or in like fudgy metric, um, which can be annoying, but it's 90% metric. Yeah, I would say like the only time you need to watch out like particularly is if you're buying like a commercial part like it's made by a US, US manufacturer, they might pull a fast one on you and use SAE fasteners instead of mm -hmm. metric fasteners. Uh, yep. And then that's a nightmare. Yeah. We had that nightmare mm -hmm. yep. um, yeah. where our fasteners did not fit because we did not realize they were SAE instead of uh, And it's metric. annoyingly easy to mix M4 and size four when you're like skimming a tech spec sheet early on and you're like, oh, it's four fasteners. Like, oh, that's fine. And no, that's not fine. Those are very much not the same thing. Um, the other one to consider is if you're sending it out to be machined or if you're doing machining on your own in the US, machine shops are still very much not a metric organization. And if you send them specs in metric and it requires metric bits to machine it, that will make it very expensive, especially the metric in mills. They usually stock only like inch and fractional inch and decimal inch in mills. Um, so you might do like fillets and things like that. You can save yourself a lot of money if you make those an eighth of an inch instead of a couple of millimeters. Um, just because that's something they'll have on hand, even like corner rounding and like making all of your edges fancy and rounded, that will save you money if you make that in inches, even though you designed it in millimeters. Uh, Joseph Peter is asking, how long did it take for our teams to have a mostly finalized design before we began manufacturing? <laughs> I think you well, should go first. Well, uh, we're in year three and we're not fully manufacturing yet for the whole satellite. Um, the structure, I'm hoping to have that finished by end of year because the structure is really my thesis. And so that kind of needs to be finished by end of year because I got to submit that. Uh, the whole satellite, um, I think we with COVID, we probably bumped to like a seven year time span instead of six for what we're looking at. It takes time. Uh, the second satellite, everyone says, will come in like half the time of the first one because uh, you'll just have like lots of little easy things figured out slash acquired slash you know who to call. So um, Cal Poly Pomona, we're on the other extreme um, where- Yeah, y'all are <laughs> fast. <laughs> For those of you who do not know, um, we received our launch opportunity July 20th redesigned the structure in uh, like a couple days. Well, we, we, we clean sheet designed a structure because we were a three U, we had to go down to a 1.5 U to meet what our launch provi our provider was offering. Um, and we're like, oh man, just toss it all out, just redesign it. We make some phone calls, friend of a friend of a friend, uh, got us into the machine shop like week three. So week five after getting the launch, we had the structure in hand. And there have been problems inherent with our structure because of how little time we spent um, designing it, but we've just kind of had to fudge our way around it. So there's definitely like, I would not recommend anyone do that, right? <laughs> Terrible idea. It has caused us a lot of pain and suffering. <laughs> yeah, um, but it works. So it's definitely a function of like, the longer you spend working on it, the better you'll be able to make it, right? Um, but I would actually recommend, like, if you're able to, like, if you have a shop, like, we'll just make stuff for you. Like, the earlier you can manufacture and actually physically hold something in your hands, the earlier you will figure out all of yep. the problems with it. Mm -hmm. Because it's always bigger in the CAD. Yeah. I guess that's fair in that the structure really for us is going to be like a one-year dev span. Because it's I've really started working on it, like, yeah. over the summer. I think that's pretty typical, like one year. Um, and I'm yeah. hoping to go manufacture the first iteration of it in February and then figure out everything that's wrong with that and build another one by April for submission. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's kind of where you're looking at it. Um, yes, I would say it is nice to like 3D print them the, and just say like, oh, these things fit together. Cause it's also good. Cause you can also 3D print representatives of your circuit boards or use engineering models or prototypes of them or the like and like literally put everything together. And then when you're putting it together, that's when you'll realize like, wow, this connector does not fit there. Or these wires are a lot thicker than I thought they were. And I can't actually bend them around the edge of this board, uh, especially because 3D printing it is so cheap and so easy to do if you have the CAD. 
Um, and it's nice because then you have a bunch of these little models that you can take to like university meetings and like asking for funding and like show what you've done. So I think it's because it adds like very minimal extra time, it's totally worth doing. Yeah, I would also recommend like, especially while we're virtual, like if you can send like 3D printed just models to your team um, because there've been so many times when we're trying to explain something and mm -hmm. just grabbing the model, it's like this face of the satellite is what needs it, right? Like that visual representation, especially when you're remote, right? Uh, really helps you wrap your head around things. Yeah. And if the structure works nice and you're doing like, if you have a set of like prototype boards you're working with, it's a good way to like encase them also. Like mm -hmm. it is yeah. what will be holding them in the end. So it's nice to just like assemble your boards into it. Um, the tall inches for 3D prints can bring out problems. Those problems can usually be fixed with sandpaper. Um, because the 3D prints like cost you so little, you can kind of be a little more aggressive with making them fit together. Um, I also, I do have a separate version of mine that I designed for 3D printing, which is basically instead of like saying, I'll tap these holes, I like made holes wide enough to just kind of put pins through it and like hold it together for testing. Um, but it's something that can be worked with. Um, software. I would say SolidWorks is what I've seen used for like 90% of CubeSat structures and like 90% of CubeSat in university stuff in general. Um, I don't actually have much familiarity with Siemens and X, so I do not have a good answer there. Michael? Yeah, I would, uh, my recommendation is it doesn't really matter what CAT software you use, yeah. just use what your team is comfortable using. Um, mm -hmm. Like, uh, I, I, at Bronco Space, we use a combination of SolidWorks and um, Fusion 360. Usually, like, it's not an amazing transition trying to move, like, an assembly from one to the other, yeah. but it works. And um, really, one of the things that I actually saw as a real, like, bottleneck was that we had, like, one person who was really proficient, like, re like really speedy with the CAD, right? Um, and like, if we had asked him to like, go use some other CAD software, he probably would have been, would have been fine still. But like, um, if someone's comfortable using something, just let them do it. Cause the time you'll save just like from like figuring out how to, how to use it is gonna, um, yeah. like, yeah. Also use whatever one your university teaches all of their classes in, because that gives you free, like, you don't have to onboard freshmen on like, okay, this is CAD and this is how to use it. If the freshman like engineering 101 class uses SolidWorks, use SolidWorks because all of your members will have some baseline level of functionality with it, including like the non mechies will often know it if it's what your university uses primarily. And so it's nice to then have everyone kind of can interpret this model, can like rotate it and look at it and at least do basic edits without having to ask for help. Slash there's usually also yeah. one package your university is paying for and use that one. Yeah, there are some considerations like Fusion 360 is cloud-based. That's why we use it. So like the assembly just lives in the cloud. And as long as you know how to open the software, you can load it on your computer. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Yeah. If you're using SolidWorks, I think GrabCAD works really well with SolidWorks. Um, you can do the plugin and it's basically GitHub for CAD. Um, it's a similar like push-pull architecture of you're like pushing it to the repo and then everyone can download it and it saves all of your iterative versions automatically. Um, but yeah, definitely do some sort of management, either use cloud-based like Onshape or Fusion 360, or do use SolidWorks or like AutoCAD Inventor or one that's like desktop based and have some sort of management platform, whether that's like straight GitHub, a Google drive that you organize meticulously, or I think GrabCAD works really, really well. Um, use one of them and make everyone use it consistently and like the same way because otherwise by iteration 50, your CAD pile mess will turn into like a disaster. You have any uh, particular horror stories you wanna like warn people about Joseph? Um, I've walked into many presentations and it's been like, okay, this is the one laptop that can load the file because someone misnamed things or put things in weird places. And it's like, okay, if I open it on this laptop, it will work. If I open it on any other laptop, it will break horribly. 
and we will fix this after we present it. Yeah. So I guess to get to um, Arshia's question, like, would GrabCAD fix those problems? I think GrabCAD does fix those problems. Um, it j like everything you do, if you keep your version names consistent, it will save like CubeSat structure. And then it'll have like mark one, two, three, 500 under that. And you can at any time roll back to an earlier iteration. Um, it takes a little bit more getting used to because it is like a, at the end of a work session, you have to like save and then push all of your files to the cloud repo. Um, and it doesn't work amazingly if multiple people try and work on the same thing at the same time and then push like five competing ones. Um, you can kind of get around that, um, but it can sometimes have like version mismatch. I have found it though to be like the best solution of I've done mm -hmm. projects and satellite stuff in Google Drive. And I think once you train your people to use GrabCAD, it works better than Google Drive and takes less time. But there's a like a half an hour to an hour initial investment of like get everyone comfortable with it slash make them use it and use it every time, not half the time because half the time doesn't work. That's also horror stories. Um, yeah, so our stuff is in GrabCAD and we I've done it a lot for like even class projects. It works pretty well for. Um, other service I mentioned, um, I think I had said Onshape. That's a, it's similar to SolidWorks online in the cloud uh, CAD program. It's basically Fusion 360, but it's styled like SOLIDWORKS. So if you have people who are used to using SOLIDWORKS, it'll be more familiar than an Autodesk styled program. Um, it's just a competing offering. Like it works pretty much. It works. I like SOLIDWORKS more, but that's just like personal preference. People use Onshape for like big projects, small projects, everything. It works fine. Our Harvard robotics team uses it for everything and they've never had an issue with it. So. I can ask a leading question, Joseph. If you were able to sort of like impose your will on the industry and say, this is the standard, right? Like what kind of, I mean, I guess it's your thesis, right? Like what kind of structure yeah. would you impose your will as? Yeah, so I think it would be really nice if CubeSat boards would follow PC-104 compliance actually, um, because a lot of them say they're PC-104 compliant right now. And then if you actually go and measure them, they are not or like things are just slightly different and then you stack four boards up and they don't work. Um, especially the stacking headers, because those are really nice in theory if everyone did stacking headers and you could just like slap all of your boards together, squish and it's done. And it's really nice like electrically also if you'd have good connections and you wouldn't have wires running everywhere. Uh, that would be nice. Non-satellite related, it would be nice if like FEA software like Abacus or Ansys could get a user interface that is not like designed to be difficult to use. <laughs> um, those those programs have been around forever and it shows. Like, See, I, th I, I think the difficulty to use is like, a, it's like job security, <laughs> right? It, it is. No, I'm convinced yeah. that it's designed in and it's also that they're so difficult to use once someone has learned how to use them if you changed it on them, there would be like a riot. <laughs> um, because like you spend like a year learning how to use Abacus properly. And so they can't change anything. It's like the same yeah. UI it's had since 2004. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, because it is. Yeah. We uh, didn't talk about deployables at all, I think. Um, and we don't have a workshop lined up for them actually, but do you have any like thoughts you want to because they're structure adjacent, like you yeah. know, they have to go on to structure the interface and everything. Yeah, so I haven't worked on that so much, but Harvard's what our like satellite project we're working on is a soft robotics influenced like deployable solar panel. So like unrolling under uh, uh, nitinol or like air pressure enforced. Um, I think those are the two that are remaining in the like prototypes list. Um, so big things with deployables is A, when you do your vibrational analysis, you really have to consider the deployable. Those are like what will make your structure die on vibrational simulations and testing. Um, a rigid aluminum box very rarely actually at CubeSat size has issues with vibrations. Like it's very, very rare that you'll design a structure that will not be in those requirements. Um, deployable solar panels, deployable antennas, very easy to design one that will have a terribly low resonant mode and will just like explode if you put it on that launcher 
or will not explode, but will shake itself to death inside the structure before it ever gets a chance to deploy. So considering that is big, how it couples to the structure is big, and just how it's going to actually come out. Like that's a separate set of burn wires or springs or however you're planning on like actuating to force open a slot for it. Uh, Cause very few people like the idea of just like leaving a side of their satellite open and just have it like come out of there freely. So those are all things you really like want to think about. Um, good places to look for inspiration is others, like there's a lot of CubeSats now versus like four years ago that have done deployables. Um, and a lot of them have published like senior theses and the like on how they did that. So there is actually now like a body of knowledge you can draw on for that. Right on. Um, yeah, we're about five minutes over the time slot. So any last questions from the crowd this evening or we'll probably wrap up. I know it is uh, 10 p.m. Uh, well, are, are, are you still on the East Coast or? Oh, no, no I'm, on, I'm on the West yeah. Coast right now, actually. Really? Uh, so. Yeah. Wait, 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 which part of the West Coast? Seattle. Okay. Very conveniently Very Pacific time zone. Yes, it is. <laughs> yep. All right. Yeah. Any last questions, guys? Yeah, that's uh, perfectly good. I can take Discord questions pretty much any time this next week. So probably going to go eat dinner right now. But if you shoot them <laughs> my way, I can take a look at them later tonight and shoot your response or whatever. Yeah. All awesome. right. Well, well, yeah. Hope yeah. it went well for everyone. Um, and we recorded this. It looks like everything worked with the recording. So we'll be putting it up on uh, YouTube after this, uh, once I get it processed and uploaded and all. Um, but yeah, feel free to shoot any structures questions my way over the course of the hackathon. I may or may not have internet service over the weekend, um, but everyone have a good week and enjoy. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night.